Well, it's been a good few days here. Uh, praise God for all that He's doing. It's been nice to kind of meet people out there in the foyer as they come in uh, and to hear that, uh, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I just feel like I'm being renewed. I'm feeling like I'm being set free. I feel like I'm understanding who I am. I feel like I'm a new creation. And, you know, that's kind of cool because if you are in Christ, you are a brand new creation. Amen? Amen. The old is gone. The new has come. Sometimes the problem is, is that we've believed on Jesus and we hear God's word that says that we're a new creation and it says that the old is gone. And yet we feel opposite. We feel different. We feel so much like the old will never leave. The old is clinging on to me and that I I believe that I'm new and at first I felt like I was new but now it's starting to feel like I'm just having to take that by faith. <laughs> and the old feels really, really real to me. Uh, and so the neat thing about it though is that you've got God from eternity speaking Speaking his unchanging, unfailing words, saying things to you that don't really, he doesn't check with your feelings to see how you feel, to see if you feel like you're new. He just tells you the old is gone. The old is gone. The new has come. You are a new creation in Christ because I've made you, I've placed you in there. And so it becomes this constant anchor for our soul. Yes. Amen? Yes. And so our souls do need anchoring, don't they? Yes. Because this world can be like a tossing uh, sea. That, yeah, <laughs> how much for... <laughs> and this world world can be like, <laughs> like a tongue. <laughs> I took two steps back, man. <laughs> yeah, I took two steps back. Welcome. If you can't get here on time, just get here. We'll make room, all right? There's... <laughs> There's a there's a seat here somewhere for y'all. Amen. Good. Well, hey, uh so, the, well, I forgot what I was saying, but if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. No matter how you feel, no matter what other people say, no matter how you look on the outside. But as you begin to believe these things and you believe you begin to receive these things into your heart, it truly does change you. The neat thing about it in, in John chapter 8, Jesus said this. If you abide in my word, if you continue on in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That means that if you don't know Jesus, if you aren't continuing on in his truth, you're you're wandering off in deception and deception is bondage. Deception is bondage. The truth is what sets us free. The truth not what you feel is true, not what somebody else feels is true, but the truth. And the neat thing about it is that truth is reality from God's perspective. Yes. Because we're in a day where kind of everybody's got, well, that's your perspective, that's your perspective, that's my perspective. But the truth is what God sees. From his perspective. Amen? Yes, amen. And so his perspective sets us free, but we have to be willing to hear what he says. Now, yesterday I used the analogy. If you've ever had somebody who's, who thought you were upset at them, but you weren't upset at them, you know, and they're coming up to you and saying, well, why are you so mad at me? And then you say, I'm not mad at you. And then they say, well, why did you do this, this, and this? Well, I'm, I did this and this and this because that's what I needed to do, but I'm not doing it because I'm mad at you. And eventually, when they begin to receive what you say, that the relationship shifts. They're, they're not uneasy around you anymore uh, because they've believed what you had to say, that you really were telling them the truth that I'm not upset at you. There's no reason for you to be self-conscious or, or wondering what's wrong. 
So it's important that we understand that, that God is able to tell us the truth. How many of you have received Jesus and then you had uh, an initial just experience of joy and peace and then something happened and you began to feel like God's upset at you, like God's mad at you, like God's distant from you. He's not as close to me as he once was and things like that. But you need to know something. It's only in your feelings, it's only in your soul, it's only in your thoughts that you can be distant from God. Because when you receive Jesus, your spirit has become one with Him. Your spirit has become one with Him. And the Son, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Now, this is the cool thing about it. Sons set people free. Sons set people free. Jesus is the Son who sets us all free. But then when He sets us free, He makes us sons. He brings us out of slavery and into sonship with the Lord, with, with God Almighty. We become born again children of God. And we are set free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Amen? God wants us walking in freedom from deception, freedom from bondage, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from sin. Amen? Amen? He doesn't set us free in grace so that we're free to sin. That's how slaves live. Right. To commit sin is to be a slave of sin. Amen? Yeah, but you know what? I don't present, we don't have to present ourselves to the power of sin anymore so that sin works in us. If we realize that we've stumbled, if we realize that we've fallen, that doesn't mean that it owns us, does it? The bondage of sin has been broken over our lives. The Proverbs say this, it says, The righteous man may stumble seven times, but he gets back up. Amen. So do you know what? If you stumble, here's the neat thing about it, is your stumbling does not define you to God. It's the fact that you can't stay down anymore. You keep getting back up and you keep walking with Him. Isn't that good? He doesn't look at you and say, well, you stumbled six times. You're just a stumbler. He doesn't say that. He says, you know what? You got back up six times. You got back up six times. The righteous man may stumble seven times, but he gets back up. Why? Because he's righteous. He doesn't live on the ground. He doesn't live in sin. He doesn't live in bondage. When I I was when I was a when I was not born again I was in you too you were like a brick I was like a brick or a sponge right yes. what happens if you throw a brick into the pool it just sinks to the bottom if you throw a sponge in the pool what happens it just absorbs the pool and sinks as well you know what that's what we were we were living under the power of sin we were just absorbed with it and then we became born again and we became beach balls right when you throw a beach ball in a pool and guess what happens it's filled it's filled with a different realm it doesn't it's not filled with water it's not filled with deadness it's filled with air from above amen and we're filled with life from above and so as long as we have this life from above that we're going to be different guess what you can take a beach ball and you can force the thing under the water but if you force the beach ball under the water everything in in the beach ball is wanting to get back up because it's its nature to rise up to rise up you have been if you've received Jesus Christ you've received resurrection life you've received life that's holy life that's from above you've received uh, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that is your life yes. amen? amen and that makes you brand new on the inside it makes you brand new in your spirit and you have now access to something. Now, some of you probably already know this, but I just want to quickly cover this. Um, let's see. Tina, come here, sweetheart. You stand on this side of me. Noel, you come and stand on this side of me. I can tell them what to do because they love me and they, and, and they know I'm trying my best up here, so they're going to help me. All right. So, I am a soul. Tina is my spirit. Noel is my body. 
Much better looking than mine, my real one, okay? But here's the neat thing about it, is that when we're born, when we come out of our mom's uh, in, uh, womb, when we're born, we're born and our spirit is dead. Tina, go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> our spirit our spirit is dead and we are, we have a soul that's living in a body and all of our perceptions with reality on the inside I have a mind that thinks I have a heart that feels I have a, a will that chooses but all of my interaction for everything that I'm taking into my soul is through my eyes that see my ears that hear my five senses and so everything that I do everything that I absorb is through this thing. And Jesus said this, you walk in darkness. You walk in darkness. You're, you're without light. But I've come as light into this world. And when we receive Jesus, guess what happens? Bang! Amen. Now... <laughs> In deeper than my soul, deeper than my own thoughts, deeper than my feelings, deeper than my desires, I am now one with Jesus Christ. Now I have access through the Spirit. I can actually interact with God. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven, nor can you even see it. But guess what? Now my spirit is alive, and I can enter into the kingdom of heaven. I can taste and see that God is good and so my soul now has access to life. Amen? Amen. Access to eternal life. I live with that and now I don't just have soul power. I've got spirit power. My soul can draw life and love and peace and joy from the spirit and now it's not me just trying to pull it off with my soul to walk like Jesus Christ. It's Jesus coming to fill my soul, reign over me so that now we got the we got <laughs> <laughs> we got the spirit <laughs> reigning in the soul and living out through our bodies. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good job. <laughs> so here's where it gets to be interesting. The enemy is the prince of the power of what? Darkness. This world, of darkness, right? Out in this world. Yeah. And so he's always trying to get us out into the flesh, out of the spirit, yeah. out of the spirit. He's trying to get our soul not just to, yes, we're always allowed to interact with this world, but we don't want to just interact from the standpoint of our own thoughts, our own understanding, our own feelings, our own perceptions. We want the mind of Christ dwelling in our mind. We want the heart of Christ dwelling in our hearts. And so whatever we're going through, we have an anchor yes. for our soul. Yes. Amen? Amen? We have our spirit made one with Jesus Christ, anchored us in eternity. So that, guess what? My spirit is seated with Christ in heavenly realms. Yeah. Amen. And so th when I turn my attention to Christ in my soul, that I can just enter in and draw the glory of God, the fellowship of God, the peace of God, the love of God, the truth of God, and I can just get nice and saturated <laughs> with heaven Take it in. in any situation. And we've been talking about some of that through... These last couple of days, okay? But what I want to do now is I want to turn our attention into a couple of the strategies that the enemy uses to try to bog us down because uh, and, and how we can uh, counteract those and get free, okay? Does that make sense? So one of the things that the enemy tries to do is to get us to take offense, Oh, yeah. is to get us to take offense. He tries to get us offended at other people so that our hearts become wrapped around the things that we perceive others to have done us wrong. Amen? Amen. So Jesus tells a story in Matthew 18, and He says this story. He says, there once was a king, and he had a steward that 
that it turned out that this guy owed him a bazillion dollars, right? It was a lots of money. And he called that guy to him and said, Hey, I, what is this I hear about you squandering a bunch of my resources? Pay up. And he said, I don't have it. And he said, Well, I'm going to have to throw you in jail. And the guy pled, Please don't throw me in jail. I'm sorry. I'll do everything I can to pay you back. I didn't mean to lose it. And the, and the king had mercy on this guy and said, You know what? Just forget it. Forget it. I'm letting you off the hook. Yeah. Your account is settled. Debt, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. And you know what? That guy went out from the king's presence and he saw a poker playing buddy of his. And that guy owed him a hundred bucks. And he said, Hey, hey, buddy, get over here. You owe me a hundred bucks and started choking him. Ah! You know what? I'm trying to pay it, you know? He says, no, that's it. I'm taking you in. I'm calling the cops right now. And he called the cops on that guy, had him arrested and everything. Now, some people saw this from across the street and said, you shouldn't. And they told the king. They told the king. And the king said, what? After what I've done for him. Yeah. Call him back. Call him back. And he called the guy back and said, What is this I hear that you're so in love with justice now? I thought you were a mercy lover. You started demanding justice. He started going, pay me what you owe. Pay me what you owe. You owe me. You should have done this for me. Oh, you owe me. Right? He says, oh, that's the way we're going to do it now. All right. Plea deals off. Since you demand justice, let's just make this consistent instead of hypocritical. If you just want justice, and if you want everybody having to square up with everybody, now you square up with me. And he said, I can't do it. And he threw, he said, threw him into jail to be tortured. And guess what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35? He said, this is why you should forgive your brother from your heart, lest my Father in heaven do this to you. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that God's going to torture us. It means when we close our heart up to grace, when we start demanding justice from other people, it gives us. Uh, it gives the principles of justice authority over our life. Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. And what he was saying was this, is that the very same standard that you use to judge other people is the same standard that's, that's, that you're going to operate by. And, and the people that I've seen this, that they receive grace, they also give grace. Do you know that the very same beat of the heart that draws blood in also pumps it out. And so if one side of the heart stop, closes down, if the side says, you know what? I'm not sure that I've got enough blood in here. So if the given out side closes up, you know what? The other side can't take any in. And grace is like that. If you stop giving grace, if you stop giving grace, you stop receiving grace. And guess what you get? A heart attack. Yep. Spiritually. Yes. Spiritually. Yes. Because, because life and love and grace, it must flow. You must give it away. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. I've met a lot of people that know that they're supposed to forgive. Okay? And I know that it can be very frustrating to come into a church and be told, well, you should just forgive. And, and because deep down inside, there's this feeling of, okay, you just don't know what they did to me, <laughs> right? And when it's really bad, you know, and, and, and things really hurt. And usually what's happened is that that situation or that person has become such a big focus in their heart, right? Is that you, you don't realize you're going, they owe me. They should have been good. Nah. Right. And it's like, okay, then let's just go to God and let him just get everything you're supposed to give him. Right. Right. 
You understand that that's the situation that you've put yourself in in practicalities, practically speaking. So it's so important. It's so important that you understand a couple of things. Forgiveness from the heart is a miracle of God. It's a miracle of God. It's something that we... It, it, there's some truths that I want to give you about forgiveness. I want to give them to you, okay? Because sometimes, sometimes people have a hard time... Okay, guys... <laughs> Stay with me here. That's all right. I'm glad that you're that you're enjoying the sermon, but there's a couple of other people around you that are like, I'm really trying to pay attention here. So hold on just a second. Now, here's some things about forgiveness that people get confused about, so it makes it very difficult for them to forgive. Here's a, here's a couple things. The first thing is this, is that forgiving someone is not saying that they didn't do something wrong. It's not saying that they didn't do something wrong. It's, it's admitting they did something wrong. Okay? It's choosing not to hold on to the personal offense and to let the wrongs that they've done to you become Lord in your heart. Amen. Because as long as you hold on to the offense, the pain and the offense of that situation has a grip on your heart. But when from your heart you say, you know what? That was wrong. I'm letting it go. I don't want to hold on to this thing. This thing does not have any authority over my life. I'm sorry that they did it, but you know what? I'm not going to try to hold on to them and say, pay me what you owe. Here's why. If they could pay it, they would have given it to you. They can't pay you what they don't have. Their pockets are empty. Amen. They did things that were wicked and dark because they didn't have light in them. They need grace themselves. So why are you going to let the darkness in them become Lord in your heart? No way. Mm -mm. Do you understand that? And so I've seen people that have been crushed because of what their father did when they were young or their mother didn't do or did do when they were young or what some other Christian did or what's worse, what some pastor or youth leader did. I I know somebody who was molested by their youth leader and then told to keep it quiet for the sake of the church. That's very wrong. It is wrong. And so, listen to me. Hear, hear me out on this. This society and the way that the world works has this way of, of turning people into victims and villains. Right? And so a villain, nobody has any, uh, any heart for Hitler. Do you understand that? Because he's a villain. And so you can just, just, just whatever you want to do to Hitler, he just deserves it sort of thing. And if you're a victim, what, here's the thing that's interesting. Did you see that that guy who went out of the king's presence, he saw himself as a victim of that guy who owed him a hundred bucks. But guess what? He was totally blind to the fact that he was acting out of his pain and out of that darkness... And that, that the fact that he wouldn't let the hundred bucks go, that that turned him into a monster. Yeah. And so when you let the offenses that other people have, have leveled against you become the thing that you hold on to, there's no life in them. There's no grace in them. There's no peace in them. There's only death and bitterness in them. And guess what? You give that thing lordship in your life when you choose not to let it go. And so I want to let you know that through Jesus Christ, you can let it go into God's hands. He said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's putting justice in the hands of God. Not that you necessarily even want them to have vengeance. Um, but that you understand that justice, only perfect, impartial justice can be met out by God. Because we get very partial, don't we? We, we have a tendency to play to our own favor. 
You know, I wish you wound up in my courtroom. You'd never see the light of day again, sucker, is the way we think. You know, why? Because we're not impartial at that point. Okay? And so the best thing that we can do with the offenses and the hurts and the pains that other people, because they've mistreated us, is to recognize a couple things. The reason they treated us the way they did is because they were filled with what they were filled with. They were in bondage to sin and darkness themselves. And they would not have treated us that way if they were filled with truth and knew their value, knew their destiny, and knew my destiny, and knew my value. And so they're in worse shape than you are because at least you can see that it's wrong. And when you let it go to say, you know what, I'm not going to let darkness in them become darkness in me. I'm going to hold on to the light. I'm going to hold on to grace, forgiveness, and mercy. And I'm going to let this go and say, Thank you, Jesus, for not holding me to that standard because I've done to other people the very thing I'm upset at them about. (laughs) And if you looked close and hard, maybe you didn't do it to the same degree that it got done to you, but you did similar things or are at least capable of them. And if you didn't do those exact same things, you certainly did some other things. Things. Amen? Yeah. And when you do things that are wrong, do you want people making that your, their definition of your value for the rest of your life? Or do you want them to, please forgive me, let's just get past this because I'm growing, I'm not perfect. And if you want mercy for yourself, why not receive that? But that when, then what you freely receive, freely give. Amen. Freely Amen. give. Freely give it. You didn't earn it. And it feels good to be forgiven. You know what? So forgiveness does not mean that you're telling those people they didn't do something wrong. It's basically saying that the wrongs that you've done to me, I'm not holding on to those anymore. I've released those. Where do you release them to? You release them at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross. The very place where you were forgiven. You go into the presence of the King and say, thank you for the mercy that I've received. I owe you billions and billions and kajillions of dollars and you've forgiven me the whole debt you've paid it all and I'm going to let the blood that paid for me count for this situation too all right now here's another truth about forgiveness that sometimes confuses people forgiveness is not reconciliation Okay, for you to forgive, for you to forgive someone, you can do that in your own heart between you and God. Uh, But that does not mean reconciliation, uh, meaning that your relationship with that person is restored, because for that to take place, they need to truly repent and they need to come to you and ask you for forgiveness. And that's different. And there's many people who get themselves caught in a, in unhealthy living situations, unhealthy relationships, and because the abuser, they feel they regret after the they've done the abuse, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, please don't call the cops, please just forgive me. Say, you know what, I do forgive you. Uh, yes, operator, he's right here. Yeah, please send a car over right now. I thought you said you were going to forgive me. I do forgive you. I'm not holding it against you. But I'm not going to forgive you. Right. Do you, <laughs> do you understand? I'm putting you into the hands of God. Um, so that's not that's not wrong. That's not hypocritical. Um, it's it's uh, forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Uh, you, for example, you know if if your husband's been running around on you uh, and things like that, you don't need to let their behavior become the center of your heart. You know because you're not you're going to chase your tail trying to get them to give you the kind of love that you can only receive from God. So you need to turn to the Spirit to say, I'm letting all this go. If you don't, what ends up happening is you're fighting to get what your soul wants out here. No. And you should... Repentance is what? Turning to Jesus. Okay? This is really important. This is really important. Is this helping anybody? Amen. Okay. Now, uh, forgiveness does not depend upon the other person. No. 
You can forgive somebody between yourself and God, even if they're, aren't, if they're not sorry or they're no longer even around. Sometimes you have people that you need to forgive that are dead. They've been dead and buried. You know, the funny thing about it, this is why forgiveness is so important and such a powerful part of the kingdom, is because you've got people that are dead and buried. They've not thought of you for 40 years. Right. And yet, it's still impacting every day of people's lives sometimes because they're holding on to this thing. Well, my dad, well, tell me about your dad. You live with him still? No, he's been dead for 10 years. You mean you're a product of, of your dad's insufficiencies? And listen, I'm not making light of the fact that parents can do some pretty hideous things to their children. I'm just saying to you, that you can let it go from your heart. Amen. Amen. Because your heart has something far more valuable. The reason that it feels like you want to take offense is because your heart knows that this is wrong. This is not right. Okay, But here's the cool thing about it. You can hold on to the wrong or you can let go of the darkness and embrace the light. What do you need? You didn't get it from them, but you can get it from Jesus Christ. After you let the other thing go. Amen. Or as you let it go. Sometimes what happens is that you receive grace from Jesus Christ. And receiving that grace pushes the other out. Okay? Amen. Now, um, forgiveness is choosing from the heart to let the offense go. And putting the one who did the wrong into God's hands. Amen. It's choosing from the heart. Sometimes we know, I ought to forgive them. I ought to forgive them. Right? It's not just knowing you ought to and deciding you're going to do what you ought. It's from the heart. It's releasing the offense. It's releasing the offense unto God. And sometimes you have to do that numerous times. You just have to decide, that's the posture of my heart. I'm letting that go. And I'm grabbing on to the grace that I find in Jesus Christ. Amen. For, but forgiveness is a deliberate choice from the heart. But it is not feelings. Amen. It is not feelings. Amen. Forgiveness is a deliberate choice from the heart. But it's not feelings. So in your heart you choose to let this go. You choose to let the offense go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is one of the big things. That when you for yourself need to find emotional freedom. When... Um, or when you're ministering to other people and you realize that they're coming out of some stuff and they've got some th things going on. The funny thing about it is that sometimes as people have got this stuff going on in their lives, they're not aware of it right away. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So um, I believe it's First John. I'm going to cheat here and look at my notes again. Is that all right? That's just one I don't have memorized. Uh, First John chapter two verse ten. It says, "The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him." What does that mean? Listen, I used to think for a long time this means that the one who loves his brother is walking in the light, and when people watch his life, there's no cause for them to stumble. But here's, I, I don't believe what that, that's what it means. I believe it means this, is that when I'm walking in the light, mm -hmm. when, I, when I'm seeing the truth, I'm free. The Son has set me free, so I'm walking in the truth of, of my value, of their value, of the redeeming love of Jesus Christ, and I'm just going to, by nature, reflex, I'm going to love my brother. Amen? Yeah. And I'm not going to allow there to be some cause of offense in me. Meaning, you know what? I'm going to love you up to this point, but okay, sucker, now you, the, the gloves are off. You know, you, you bring it, you, you know, and, and, and oh, I'm fine. You're the one who made me do this. You're the one. And so you gave them authority over your life. That's not light. That's deception. That's not freedom. That's bondage. Amen. And so other people are not the are not responsible for how you feel or how you act. 
You are. You are. No matter how they're acting, okay? Now, sometimes love, love for your brother doesn't mean that you just stand there and let people do all kinds of things necessarily. So I'm not talking about staying in an abusive situation or a toxic situation. But I am, uh, so I'm trying to guard against those kind of wild misinterpretations that could uh, put people in, in, in horrible situations. But what I mean is this, is that the love of God is filled with the light and that you're not at this place where you're saying, where you're blaming other people for not being able to love. And so if you're feeling that there's this place of darkness or place of, of, of where you're stumbling, sometimes what's happened is that there's this cause of offense. There's this root of offense inside of you. And sometimes it's not really coming from the current situation. It's actually coming from something that you never let go of a long time ago. And that person just kind of tripped your trigger again. Do you understand? And so now you're blowing up at people around you that you're living with. And the truth is that all that's happening is, and sometimes we even say this, you just tripped my trigger. Right? And you act like it's everybody else's fault. You know I got a trigger here. I got a trigger there. I got a trigger there. You know? And so y'all need to just stay away from my triggers or you're going to get, you know, angry daddy kind of thing. And we think that somehow that that's justified. You know what? Every place you got a trigger is a place that you need light. You need to let go of the cause of offense. You need to let that go. You need to let it go from the heart. And the only way to do that is to bring it out into the light. Amen. And here's why that's so important. Because so many times people have never grown up uh, in a situation. They just let their emotions die down. They get all upset and frustrated about something. And then they just go walk off. You know, they walk off for a while. Yeah. And they haven't forgiven anything. They just let their emotions settle down. And so up underneath a settled down emotion, there's now still this offense that they're holding on to. You know, and they'll walk back in the house and they're nice and calm and they're just not talking to anybody. Well, what's wrong with dad? What do you mean what's wrong with me? You know what you did. So see, dad's calm now. He's not upset. He's not angry. But what's happened? The fence is still there. You're still holding everything that everybody's done wrong lately. You're holding that against them. What do you need to do? Forgive from the heart. And the best way I know to do that is to remember that story and go right to the cross of Jesus Christ. And you try to hold on to your fence while you're looking at the Son of God slain for you. When you're walking in the light, see, darkness tries to blind us from God and get us all wrapped up in ourselves. Why? Because that's Satan's mindset, isn't it? He's all into himself. But when you let go of that, then you can walk in that joy and that peace. And Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Amen. The power to forgive comes from Jesus. You're not the source of it. So you can just sometimes just lay hold of his, Him and say, Lord, you've already died for everything that they've ever done. You've already died for everything that I've ever done. So I open up my heart. Just take this offense out of me. I release it to you. And you, there's sometimes a work of prayer in His presence. Remember in Mark chapter 11, Jesus was speaking about you know how He cursed the fig tree and it died. And this is why it's so important. And this is the relationship. He said, have faith in God. Amen. And you can speak to a mountain and it will move. So when you stand praying, believe that you've received what you've asked for and it will be done for you. And if you have offense towards anyone, let it go. Forgive them from the heart. 
Here's, here's why. God is not doing background checks about who He's going to do miracles for and give grace to and, and move mountains in their life. And so it's so important when you're praying for somebody else or you're praying for a situation in your life that you're not trying to evaluate, are they worthy of it? Yes, they are. Amen? Yes. Are they worthy of it? Because they might have been a stinker. Amen? Amen. Now, if you think, if you're holding on to their offenses then you're not able to exercise faith for them very good. And if you're doing that for other people, I'll guarantee it, you're doing it for yourself too. Yes. Because the measure that you use is the measure that you're stuck with. You use it not just for other people. That same measure comes back to you. Amen? That's the way God created our conscience. Amen. Okay? Amen. All right, so so the first big thing that I help people to, to deal with, it's not necessarily the first, but one of the big things that I help people deal with to help them uh, receive and walk in emotional freedom is letting go of the offenses in their life. Now, Here's the surprising things I found out is that it's not always other people that need to be that they need to forgive. Sometimes they need to forgive the offense that they've taken towards God. Many times, many times oh, and themselves. Uh-huh. Sometimes they're so mad and disgusted at themselves for something that they've done. They realize that something they did hurt somebody. And, and, and they've, they've turned in on themselves. But I want to let you know that holding on to the wrong that you did is not making it certain that you're never going to do it again. Sometimes people hold on to the past and say, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Newsflash, none of us do. None of us. Forgiveness is not something you deserve. None of us do. None of us. Okay? Now, here's the cool thing about it. To be forgiven is the one thing that allows you to truly let it go so that you move on. And it's a more for certain guarantee that you're never going to go there again. Because the more you hold on to it, you're giving that thing authority and a place in your life. And you don't even realize it. You are. By holding on to that thing that, that you did, that you think is so serious. I remember one time I met a guy in Walmart, and he was in one of those uh, wheeler doodle things. And he was a paid assassin for our government. He was a military uh, trained assassin. Uh, and, and we got in a conversation, and he told us an, um, some amazing stories. He was actually, he had Saddam Hussein back when George Bush Sr. Was in, uh, was in power, and they did that first Gulf War. He had Saddam Hussein in his crosshair. And, and could not pull the trigger because Jesus Christ gave him a vision right out in front of him because Saddam Hussein was standing in the schoolyard with a bunch of children. He knew that if he took that shot, that head was going to explode all over those kids and traumatize him. And he walked away and got a dishonorable discharge. But he said when we started talking to him about forgiveness uh, in his life and how Jesus is real and how Jesus appeared to him, not just to protect those kids, but to show him uh, that, that he was real. I started talking to him about that. And he said, you know what? I've done things that I do not deserve to be forgiven about. And you know what I did? I just said to him, listen, none of us deserve what Jesus has done for us. But Jesus is worthy. Jesus, the blood that he paid is, is sufficient for all of us to be forgiven. And you holding on to those things that you did wrong, it's not making you a better person. No. It it's keeping you from the grace that would allow you to truly move forward, to truly become a, the person that you want to be. And the reason that you're so disgusted with yourself is because your heart doesn't even agree with those things. 
You don't even want to have done those things now. So there's already a part of repentance that's already taken place. You're turned from it. Now let it go and grab hold of the grace. Amen? Amen? Turn to Jesus. Don't just get partway turned from it and hold on and drag that thing through the rest of your life. As if that thing defines you from now on. Stop dragging the past around. Because God says what Jesus has done for you... He counts it as sufficient. Remember when the when the the first Passover took place? They, they slayed the lamb and they stayed in the house and they ate the lamb. Uh, and, but before they went in the house, they put the blood on the outside of the door. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, what does that mean? That means that, that it's not important so much for them to see the blood. It's what God sees in the blood. Amen? That God sees the blood and says, Okay, I'm passing over this house. They've applied it to the door of their house. And so I say that the blood is worthy. What has been slain, the lamb that was slain was enough to remove their sin and their guilt. Yes. Now the question is, are you going going to say to God, He's wrong? No. Are you going to say to Jesus, it's not worthy? No. Mm. Don't add another offense to the offense that you're holding on to. Let yourself go because God wants to let you go. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says God is not holding trespasses against us because He's reconciling all men to Himself through Jesus Christ. Amen. If God's not holding you against it because Jesus paid, listen, justice has been served. This is not, there's no justice in the world. You just need to recognize you're not big enough to achieve justice for yourself. Jesus had to do it for you. Listen, hell's not even justice. That's why it never ends. No amount of suffering in hell could possibly equal the account of the offense that you've leveled at the feet of Almighty God. So then what happened on the cross? Because that paid it in full. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is amazing. We can lay all of the wrongs that's been done to us, all the wrongs that we've done at the foot of Jesus. But I want to let you know something else. Sometimes people need to to let go of offenses towards God. And not that God ever did anything wrong, but oftentimes our perceptions, we've blamed God for things and we've judged Him. We've judged Him because we've we've all had stuff happen, haven't we? We've all had stuff happen. Uh, some people have been at war. I remember my one of my uncles. Um, he went to Vietnam. He came back from Vietnam and 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 refused to go to church anymore because he said, "I can't worship a God who would allow things like that to happen." All right. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. I was on Facebook one day. You know, most Facebook theology is not really good, but every now and again I'll see something and I'll go, now that's profound. It's really good. It was Jesus sitting on a park bench and another guy sitting on a park bench. And uh, the one guy says, Well, Lord, now that we get this conversation, I've been meaning to ask you, why do you allow all these wars and famines and murders and, and hatred uh, uh, to take place on this, on this earth? And Jesus sits on his bench and he goes, hmm, that's funny. I was just about to ask you the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Do you understand that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Yes. Our circumstances are not God's responsibility. When people do wicked things, it's because they've closed their hearts to God. There's, Jesus several times calls Satan the God of this world. We, when Adam bowed the knee to Satan, he unleashed evil into the human race and onto the face of the planet. That does not mean that Satan is sovereign. It doesn't. Because God is the Lord of all. But listen, if he's going to throw Satan in the garbage, into hell, he's going to throw everyone under Satan's domain. 
domain yes. into hell. And that means He's got to, to, to throw us all there. But He's doing something amazing right now. He's redeeming us. He's getting us out from Satan's dominion. Yes. Uh, he's extending mercy and salvation. Even to people who've committed war atrocities. I, rem- I remember uh, having, uh, we were listening to the audio tape of Corey Ten Boom's life, and she was a World War II prisoner uh, in one of the prisoners, prison camps. And one of the most powerful things in that book is that after World War II, she met one of the prison guards. Yes. And, and he came to her and said, You believe what you say, don't you? And he said, this has given me hope that there's forgiveness even for someone like me. I need to ask you and I need to ask your God to forgive me. And he held out his hand and Corey said she trembled. Everything in her remembered all the wicked things that that man had done and all the precious people that had suffered so much at his hand. And everything in her was crying out, this guy does not deserve to be forgiven. Um, But she found, as she's thinking of that, then the thoughts are going off inside of her, nor do I. And she found her hand reaching out. And as soon as she grabbed hands with this man, she said it was like electricity just flowing through her. And flowing through that man, and there was a power that was released. Listen, sometimes we get so myopic about our feelings and our lives and how we get treated, and we forget all about God. God is not the one who's who's causing uh, all of these bad things to happen. It's evil. And He came on the face of this planet and suffered at the hands of that very same evil. That you and I have to go through. And He did that so He could set us free from it. And so He could kick evil in the teeth and break its bondage over our lives. That's why He came shooting out the other side. So when you receive Jesus, you receive the victory. You receive the freedom. But it's important for you to let your offense towards God go. You've got to be willing to lay down this this feeling that you're in a good position to judge God. Know Him. Decide to know Him. Decide to know Him through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Your earthly father is not a great representation of God. I'll guarantee it. No matter how good He is. Even if you had Ward Cleaver as your dad. He's not a great representation of God. Amen? Does that make sense? Is this yes. helping? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So that is the big one. That's one. That's one. It ne- not necessarily the first one. So don't take that as sequential. But it's one of the ones that's very important to help people deal with. Um, and so as you minister to them, they need to understand that forgiveness is cleansing their soul. It's washing the dirt that everybody else put in there out. And the best way to let to let that dirt out is just to let the truth in. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, here's the other thing about emotions and 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 having emotional freedom. Uh, Psalm 56 verse 3 says, "When I am afraid, I will trust in you." Yes. When I am afraid, I will trust in you says this in uh, 56 verse 2, Psalm 56 verse 2, said, My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What shall, scripture, what shall flesh do to me? So listen to this. Experiencing fear is not wrong. But experiencing bondage to fear, God wants, it's not necessarily wrong. God wants you to be free from it. Okay? So our emotions can function and experience all kinds of things. Listen, when enemies attack, sometimes you're going to experience some emotions. I love it what David Hogan says. You know, he tells this story about having, uh, uh, having head on confrontations with, with witch doctors and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden their demons appear physically you know 
in His presence, uh, not vi- but visibly, not physically, but visibly in His presence. And He stands there and He says, I'm just shaken, but I'm just like, Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. But everything in me is just going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is what He said. It's not about not feeling it. It's about not submitting to it. See, you've got an anchor for your soul. And so when your soul, when your emotions might be fear, feeling fear, we don't live from our emotions. We live from the Spirit. When I am afraid, I will trust. I will trust. I will trust in you. I will. And so you can choose to exercise your spirit even in all kinds of emotional situations. Okay? Now... Here's here's where I want to go. I want to give you all a very simple way. There's times where you're walking in the Spirit and you kind of realize that there's there's stuff that's kind of got its hooks that you're kind of dragging around a bit. And it's not necessarily because you have an offense that's coming to mind so you don't need to get all introspective. Lord, you know, you don't have to go poking around in your past, which is really cool. You, The old is gone. So God's not holding the past over you. Sometimes people minister uh, to Christians who have emotional damage and they get them, well, what about this? And what about this? And they get everything going into the past and they spend, you know, 20 years of their life navel gazing, you know. Um, when we, what we ought to do is start off, the old is gone. That's everything that was part of the old creation. It's gone. You were crucified with Christ. Congratulations. All your hang-ups got buried with Him, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, you died and uh, you've got all these issues. Well, Jesus killed you and canceled your subscriptions to the issues. <laughs> Amen? You don't have a lifelong sentence to those things. You know? You just let the magazine company know, right? You can't be cursed. You've been, Jesus became a curse for you. Your Father has blessed you. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. So you don't have to worry about all this other stuff. So many times people are feel powerless because of the past that was handed to them. Jesus is power over your past to set you free from it. Now, as you're starting to walk forward, sometimes you realize though, it's not that I'm looking into the past, but I've got emotions that are coming up that are just, you know, I'm dragging something around. Let me, let me give you an example of this from my own life. I remember several years back, I was still working uh, in the business world. And how many of you know that you have to live by faith in the business world to survive? Yes, Amen. Amen. And uh, I was given a, uh, a project that was I felt was way over my head. I was managing a budget of $1.3 million. I had teams of engineers that were way smarter than me across the country that were working for me. I was working with, uh, with, uh, with all kinds of important important people from companies like Rockwell Collins, Oshkosh Corporation, Harley Davidson, John Deere, people that are really, really smart. And I just, you know, I've got a liberal arts degree and a heart that loves Jesus and they had promoted me and I've done really good and I've learned this program. So I wasn't like totally incompetent, but at the same time, this was a challenge for me and the expectations that had been put on me. And then, but but my the leadership that promoted me was very supportive. Well, Andy, we understand your limitations, but we see your character. We see the way that, that you work with people and you're the guy who can bring the team together. So we're going to give you, you know, uh, people who can help and support you and that kind of thing. Then we had a regime change. You know, the, the everybody... You know, the CEO, uh, the CFO, the vice president, all of them uh, resigned within six months. And now we've got a regime change. And I've got, this, I've got a new boss who's basically like a pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, who, who, says, who says, you know, I want you to have the same quota of bricks and gather your own darn straw, right? And so I felt like I was, and here's the interesting thing about it, this $1.3 million 
million dollar budget was a defense department contract. Uh, so if you fail to deliver what's in the contract, uh, you are liable now for three times the amount of the contract. So it would have sunk the entire company. And I couldn't get that message through to my C C new CEO. And so here I am, I'm feeling all this pressure. I feel like I don't have enough time. Like I don't have enough smarts. Like I don't have enough, uh, resources to get this done and I'm feeling all this go on. Anybody ever felt like you're just... And, and so I felt that I was set up to fail. Mm-hmm. And and I had and I, that was right coinciding with the time. You weren't here last night so I'm not going to go into the story that we went through a failed adoption. And so... I received into my heart this mindset that God doesn't want to prosper me. What He wants to do is to teach me through through failure after failure after failure. He was he that I felt set up, set up to a no win situation, and, and so I've got all this surrounding me. And so every day I was just kind of having my quiet time with God. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to trust you. But I had all this pressure and this belief that I was in a no-win situation. All right. And so it was very difficult for me to process all of that. But I, I was getting through the day, but I felt like I was getting through the day dragging. And I didn't realize it. So then one evening, I got alone with the Lord. and was like, what is this? And, he, and, and, and I had this, this real sense that I believe that God has set me up to fail on purpose to teach me spiritual lessons. So... What I did was I identified what my emotions were believing. It wasn't necessarily what I was consciously believing, but it was what my emotions were believing. And I wrote that down at the top of a sheet of paper. And then I did something that I'm going to teach you to do in Ephesians chapter 4. Remember we looked at that last night? That... The way that we live is that we've heard Him. We've heard Christ. And we learn the truth. And the truth sets us free, right? Yeah. So John 8 and Ephesians 4 go together. But now we have Jesus living in us as the Spirit of truth. And so I've learned that you've got something deeper than your emotions. You've got the Spirit of God. The Spirit of truth leading you on the inside into all truth. And so... I just said, Lord, I said, you know, I've, I've got all this, right? That I've been set up by God in a no-win situation to fail so that He can teach me spiritual lessons. And I said, Lord, what do you say about this? What do you say about this? And I just, I just received the impression. You know what He said to me? I am able to cause all grace to abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you may abound in every good work I was like that's pretty good what else do you say about that Lord I will prosper you in all of your ways what else do you say you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you And you know what? I started wrapping my emotions. I let go of those feelings and impressions that I had taken up from my own analysis of the situation. And I began to wrap my heart around this. And you know what? This was Christmas break. I finally got the chance to, to sort of be with God and realize all that I was carrying around. And you know what I did? I went back into my work situation. I had less time and the same amount of resources. But I had such joy and such peace. And you know what else God showed me? He said this. He said, you can't fail if you if you will trust me and love me. And you know what that means? That means success is not defined by by pulling everything off on the outside. You can walk through the most horrid situation with faith in Jesus Christ and loving God and you can still have joy. 
Yeah. You really can. But there's some people who can't have joy even when they're succeeding because they're worried that they're not going to succeed the next time. There's always tense. And I, so many times we're, we're defining our life by getting all our ducks in a row. And Pastor Sean told me that one of his sayings around here is learning to pasture your shipwreck. Yes. You know? And sometimes, you know, that's what kingdom life looked like for Paul. You know, the ship is going down, but Paul, he's at peace. He's got fellowship with God. He's taking care of the people around him. He does, you know, and, and, and he finally got a word from God that, okay, you're going to live and the people that are with you are going to live. But before that, he didn't have that. Did he? But he was still praying and he was fellowshipping and he was enjoying God and he knew that, man, we're in a no-win situation. You goofy, you're taking off at the worst time of year. This is almost certain death. Didn't he say that? But yet he was, he was in a situation that he couldn't control. But he had peace because he's got an unshakable kingdom. He's got an anchor for his soul. So, here's what I want you to do, okay? Um, I'm going to give a couple of more examples. Here's, here's the two-step process. When you are dealing with things in your emotions or in your heart, in your feelings, so that you can find freedom. Uh, you don't have to go back into analyze, psychoanalyzing your past. Okay, What you can do, though, is recognize what's going on in your current, in your, what your heart might be telling you, and, and then realize this, that your, that your emotions aren't telling you the truth very often. Right? You don't, you're authorized to disagree with your feelings. Right? So, but you can, you can listen to them and say, what is it that my feelings are believing? Right? What feels true to me? Okay? Uh, because often what's going on is that what's, what's feeling true is really a lie. For example, I feel worthless. I feel vulnerable. I feel like things are out of control. I feel like nothing's ever going to be right again. I feel like no one ever loves me. No one ever likes me. I'm always misunderstood. I remember the first time that I learned this, I was actually down uh, at, at a ministry that... that uh, that I had heard that the leader of that ministry had been receiving bad reports about me from people I didn't know about. And I didn't know anything about it. And everybody that knew my ministry, you know, they were pretty happy with it. But for some reason, they had heard some, some accusations. And from what they were saying to me, they had taken them to heart. And I kept trying to set up a meeting with this ministry leader, and I still felt like he was pushing me off. Have any of you ever, you know, been in a situation? You realize that sometimes situations like that, they start to, if you're not careful, you start reacting out of that emotion instead of the truth of who you are yeah. in Christ, right? right? And so here was the interesting thing about it. They said, okay, think about a time, oh, maybe over the last couple days or over the last week or so, that you were experiencing a negative emotion. And what came to mind was this, that feeling of... And I was like... And, and then write down... And here's a simple way to do it. What were you feeling and why? And what you're looking for is that belief statement in the feelings. Not, not just, I felt afraid or I felt anxious, right? That's just the surface level emotion. But I felt afraid or I felt anxious because I felt that if I'm not understood that I'm not that I'm misunderstood and that if I'm misunderstood I could I could lose opportunity in the kingdom of God it could hurt me Right? And so I kind of wrote that down. I felt misunderstood. I, I feel misunderstood. I feel like uh, being misunderstood can hurt me. And so I just wrote that down. That's what my feelings were telling me. Right? You're vulnerable because you're, you're potentially misunderstood. And there's a lot that hangs on these other people's opinions of you. Okay? So I wrote that down at the, cross, the top of a sheet of paper. And then I just did something really simple. Do you know Jesus lives inside of you? And so you can quiet your own heart, quiet your own mind, and actually turn to Him directly. You can turn to Him and just say, Lord, what do you say about that? 
and allow Him to impress upon you the truth. He speaks truth. He speaks love. He speaks hope. He speaks encouragement. And so you can receive from Him. And the first thing I heard was, I understand you. And so I wrote that down. And then I said, what else, Lord? And He said, if I'm for you, who can be against you? And I wrote that down. And I said, what else, Lord? And He gave me several other things. And I kept, and I kept getting things from the Lord. And I kept writing them down. And I wasn't thinking about what I think Jesus wants to say to me. I wasn't up in my mind. I was turning to Him in my spirit. Do you understand that? You can do that by faith. He lives in your innermost being. He's rivers of living water on the inside. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and at first, it's important that you don't judge what you're receiving because you're going to get to know God and He knows you and He's going to speak to you in ways that are important for you. Somebody today said, I didn't, I'm beginning to realize how funny God is. <laughs> Do you know that? Somebody today said that, uh, that they came here this morning saying, well, I'm going to come and I'm going to listen to the teaching, but I am not going to go out. I'm not going to go out and, and try to meet people and meet strangers and see if we can pray for them or whatever. I just don't feel comfortable with that. That's just not me. And then the more that she was here, she realized, wow, that's Jesus. Why am I going to put a bar- why, why am I going to put a barrier uh, in, 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 his, in, uh, in his way? Because I'm going to let him use me. I can do that. Uh, but something happened that on the way, she got an impression from the Lord that was basically uh, telling her the same thing. I remember one time I, I saw, um, I, I was standing at a Walmart counter, it was really early in the morning, and I didn't have my quiet time yet. I was just waiting to see, I was, this is what I was wondering, why don't they sell coffee at Walmart? <laughs> he, that's how spiritual I felt, okay? And this guy walks by and he's pushing pushing a buggy and he's got his ankle all taped and he's got crutches coming out of the the buggy and I had just decided I had recently made a decision you know Lord when I see people if I can stop and help them I'm going to do it just like the 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 Samaritan right you know you see somebody who's getting beaten up and robbed by thieves you can do something about it do something right that's love it doesn't matter how you feel yeah. Right? It matters how they feel <laughs> and whether you're going to do something. And so I decided I was going to go pray for this guy. And here's what I said. Here's what I said to God. I said, God, this is all going to be you. What I meant was, I don't feel very spiritual right now. So this is all you. And I get about two steps towards that guy. And Holy Spirit says, it's always all me. <laughs> you can actually hear God. <laughs> That He can impress upon you. I remember when the, the people that I learned this from, they shared a story that one of the things they do in their marriage that actually helps them uh, to not get in so many arguments is that they try to help one another go to Jesus and listen. They don't fight. They just And so, okay, let's go to Jesus and listen. Right? And one time the guy's laying down and the wife is in the bed and she is tossing and turning and she is just not not settled very good. And he goes, she he goes, What's wrong? She goes, I can't sleep. He goes, I know. <laughs> and then he, he says to her, Why not? And she goes, I don't know. And he goes, Well, why don't you ask Jesus? Lord, what's bothering me? Right? And so, uh, toss, turn, toss, turn, toss, turn. And he goes, did you ask Jesus yet? You know, he's like, I'm ready to go to sleep. (laughs) And, And she said, no. And he goes, why not? And she said, I don't know. I guess I'm, I just don't want to bother him. All right. And he said, well, why don't you ask him if you bother him? And when you ask him these things, all right. Now here's the here's the interesting thing. She went to him and she she asked him that question. She said, "Lord, do I bother you?" And right away she got this strong impression. Yes. And she was like, "I got a demon in me. I got to rebuke it." You know. And and she goes, he, you know, she says to her husband, "He said yes." <laughs> and he said, "Okay, ask him why." Why? What do you mean? How do I bother you? 
And so she did. She said, how do I bother you? And right away, the Lord brought this episode to mind. Earlier that week, her daughter had gotten a splinter stuck in her finger. And, and she was crying and screaming and carrying on. And the mom said, here, let me see it. I want to help get it out. And as soon as the mom would get close, the daughter would go, ah! You know, and it went on and on like this. And finally, the mom just walked away, bothered. And she started crying. Because then the Lord showed her that I want to help you. And you won't let me help you. And she, she said, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And then, and then, guess what? She started realizing that she grew up in a, in, a, in a pastor's home. And her dad worked out of the home. And so there were a lot of times she wanted to go and hang out with her dad, but her dad's door was usually closed. And she had interpreted that very often is that... that I, I can't bother my dad. I'm not important enough that if I have something that I want to show him or something that... And she had internalized that towards her relationship with God. And God was showing her these things through a very unexpected route yeah. at first. Yeah. Now, here's the neat thing about it. is that it, That's why at first you don't judge what you're hearing, what's impressed upon you. You can just write it down. That gets it out, right? You can put it out. And then you can come back to it, okay? And then after you've had an opportunity to, to write down what the Lord's impressing upon you, it, you've got, you want to get like seven or ten really good zingers. The things that really like uh, give life to your soul, amen? Uh, and, and get those down to combat these lies, okay? So here's what I want everyone to do. On the pews in front of you, um, Pastor Sean said that there are these things. And inside of those are little, there's some sheets of notebook paper and a pen. And what I'd like everybody to do is to grab a piece of paper and a pen, just one piece of paper and a pen, and I want to walk us through a little bit of an exercise. If you want to get some space between you and the people that are next to you, that's fine. Um, but here's what I'd like to ask you to do. The first thing, and, um, and if you're you know, challenged when it comes to writing, here's what I want you to do. Is just, just uh, You can visualize this. Um, across the top of a sheet of paper, first thing I wanted you to do is just to call to mind uh, some, some negative emotion that you've been dealing with maybe sometime in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then what I want you to do is this, is I want you to ask yourself this. What is it that my feelings are believing? Not that you're embracing them as true, but what is it that my feelings are telling me? What are they? And write that out in a statement across the top of that sheet of paper. Okay? In that situation, what is it that my feelings, that negative emotion that you sometime over the last couple weeks have experienced? In that situation, what was it that my feelings were telling me were true. My feelings were believing them, right? Not that they're true. Because sometimes we don't give ourselves permission to really be honest with what's going on in here. Okay? But the Word of God makes that division between our soul and our spirit. Amen? So I know you guys are... Anybody just need a couple more minutes just to finish up what you're doing? All right? Thanks, Noel. Now, is is there anybody here that um, that as that you had an opportunity that maybe you wouldn't mind sharing uh, uh, what what you you don't have to share the situation, but what is it that you wrote down on the top of your sheet of paper, and what is it that the Lord maybe one or two of the things that the Lord spoke back to you? Yes, ma'am. My feelings are. Um, I'm believing my feelings that are saying, Elaine, you are alone. I am lost. Where am I going? And when you said, don't focus on the circumstances, turn to Jesus. 
what would the Lord say about this? And he told me in the spirit, I will never leave you or forsake you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So her feelings were telling her, I feel alone, right? So she wrote that down. Um, that you're abandoned or lost or going nowhere. And one of the things that Jesus said to her, Lord, what do you say about this? The first thing he said to her, I will never leave you or forsake you. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Is there anybody else that would mind sharing uh, some? Yes, sir. Uh, I may not be that easily liked because I don't fit into well or like uh, sometimes people just pass their tires or Okay. Uh, or turn me down a lot or whatever. Okay. It's like, if you are easily liked, yeah. sometimes it might be busy, but it's not you. Yeah. Or would you like to listen? You have a good head of hair. <laughs> awesome. So he his feelings were saying um, that uh, that that uh, you know people don't like me. And Jesus, or I'm um, not easily liked. And Jesus said to him, "You've got a good head and a good heart. You are easily liked. Praise God. Yeah. So here's some cool things. Okay." Jesus doesn't speak English. He speaks love. He speaks truth. He speaks hope. He speaks according to the revelation that He's been given, that He's given to us in the Word. So at the end of the day, we can test the, the impressions that we get. For example, let's say I feel like, well, I don't feel like anybody likes me and that I'm not easily liked. And then you get this voice and you, yeah, nobody ever does like you and you're never going to be liked. You're, you, know, you should just go kill yourself, right? Well, wrong voice, <laughs> right? So, you, so we know we can, if you get that impression, you know, uh, or something that you're not sure about, you can write it down. But if you're not sure about it, the voice of God uh, comes and gives life to you, gives light to you, and matches Jesus, right? So we've got this outside uh, uh, thing. We've got the scriptures that we can use as a grid. Um, but sometimes we need to kind of go with the, with those impressions for a little bit because the Lord is uh, kind of um, bringing some backdoor truth that's going to end up being an aha moment sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so at the, end, at the end, it's got to match up with that. It's going to build you up. It's going to encourage you. It's going to give you hope, joy, and peace. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Amen. So God, when he speaks to you, he's the God of hope and he's going to fill you with joy and peace in believing. So if you believe it, does it give you joy and peace yes. and match because God has given you hope, his hope? Yes. Um, if it doesn't, then that's something you can toss out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Good. I saw another hand up here. I thought. Yeah. Yes, sir. Gary. Well, I wrote down, uh, my feeling was hopelessness. That um, God loves people. He just tolerates me. Mm. Um, that he really doesn't, doesn't want to bless me. But what I wrote down on what he said was, I have plans to prosper, prosper you, not to harm you. Um, just to let it go and turn it over to him. And that... Uh, this is not all there is. Mm. And, and there, there's no need for being in any kind of bondage. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You know, guys have feelings. We just often don't know what to do with them. Um, but it's neat uh, when our Father shows us He's not judging us for our feelings, but He delights when we can bring our hearts to Him and say, Okay, Lord, this is what's going on in my heart right now. 
And it feels negative. It's not, li- it's not the, the mind of the Spirit that gives life and peace. It feels like death that comes from the carnal way of living. So I've got this going on. What do you say about it? The Son gives you the truth that sets you free. Okay? Now we're going to talk about what to do with these impressions here in just a second. Uh, I'm going to ask for one more. Was, what, did you have your hand up or were you just scratching your head? Do you mind sure? So, just uh, frustrated about just a uh, feeling like a need that's not being met. And <clears throat> what God, He challenged me when I listened to Him. He says, Well, seek me first, and all these things. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Okay. He tells me, He says, How much time are you spending in fellowship? Okay, so God's inviting you. He's, he's, he's doing it as a father. Seek me first. And then be honest with yourself. How, how much time? And so he's wanting more. That, he's wanting to build that relationship. So yeah, praise God. Praise God. Okay, now don't judge yourself by what others are getting. This, hopefully this was meaningful to you and kind of gave you a, a, a first run. But this is something that you can use for yourself. This is also something that you can teach other people. And you can even use them in personal discussions. You know, oh, I just feel so frustrated. Well, you know, what, when you feel frustrated, how does that make you feel about you? You know, how's that making what what's going on in here? Okay, let's ask Jesus. What does Jesus say about that? What does he say about you in your situation? You know, let, let, let's don't just say this is what I think Jesus would say. Mm-hmm. Let's don't speak for him. We know what he says in the book, and that's good. But listen, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance everything that I've spoken to you. So if there is something dynamic about re- Receiving the truth directly from Jesus. You know, nobody likes to be preached at, but everybody loves to hear God. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is a, a way to help people build their relationship, help people to get free on the inside. Um, so I hope this is helpful for you. Now listen, here's what I encourage you to do. Um, in 2 Corinthians, you can uh, write this verse down. I want to show it to you. And then we're going to close up. I've already gone a little bit long, but... Ooh, well. <laughs> uh, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, says this uh, in verse... 13, Paul says this, But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe and we also speak. So what's Paul saying? He's saying that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me is the very same spirit that wrote the word of God. And and he is the author of all those things. And so I have the spirit that knows exactly what this means. And so here's one of the things that we can do. We believe and therefore we speak what we believe. So what you receive from Jesus, your heart has been believing these other feelings. Now you can put your heart and you can begin to say, Thank you God that I am not hopeless, that I am not forgotten. You can contradict the lie and then begin to to speak forth in His presence what He said to you. That you are prospering me and that I do matter to you and that my life does have direction and does have value and I've got value beyond anything that I see that my work is not my value that I have value for you for eternity and that you can begin to make this a daily uh, moment by moment routine you can begin to saturate yourself with the voice of Jesus Jesus said if you hear me you hear the truth amen Jesus said if you abide in my words you will know the truth see it's one thing to hear the truth you heard to hear the truth from Jesus if you abide in my words if you stay in them if you 
you remain in them, then you will know the truth. It's not just that you heard it, but you'll know. You'll know it. And the truth will make you free. It will make you free. And you'll get to the place where these things that you used to struggle with in your emotions, you're not struggling with anymore. You've moved on. You're free. You've got other struggles you're dealing with now. <laughs> Brand new things that, you know, that have come to the surface. Because why? God keeps taking us further and further from glory to glory down the path to make us fully like Christ. One of the neat things that I love to do, the reason that I mix this with the ministry that He's given me to equip believers to walk in the power of God, because as soon as you start walking out in the world to walk like Jesus and to make a difference in other people's life, people get all these feelings. Well, I can't do that. You know, or, you know, I don't know how to talk to, you know, you get all these like insecurities, like I know what I want to do, but I'm not sure. And you got all these things trying to make you feel afraid, make you feel ashamed, make you quit. Amen. And if you're not careful, you believe your feelings and you let your feelings stop you from walking in the light and loving your brother as yourself. So. I want to encourage you, hold the Word of God up and you can use that to discern the difference, you know, those feelings. Now, listen, here's one thing I just want to be careful with. Um, Not all negative feelings are telling you lies. Some negative feelings are actually telling you the truth. If you're walking in immorality and the Holy Spirit's talking to you about those things, He will be, right? Because God is a God of purity. You don't say, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay, God, you know, (laughs) you know, there's no condemnation, all that kind of stuff stuff. Listen, there are things that are negative because they're negative, right? right? These aren't lies. God, what do you say about the fact that I'm feeling guilty about immorality? He's saying, leave your immorality. (laughs) Amen. Walk in me. You know, I'm not condemning you for it, but I'm calling you out of it. Amen. I'm calling you out of it because I've got something better for you. Don't sell yourself short. Now, I want to show you a little bit how these mix together. I had a buddy of mine that I was mentoring, and he went through a rough breakup that really kind of left him feeling negative. Um, and his girlfriend was, you know, supposed to be his fiance, and she just took off on him. And and he forgave her from his heart, but every time that he thought about her, or that situation, he felt emotionally. Uh, distraught, you know, like I forgive her, but here's the thing in the pain of the breakup, there had come a lie that had just embedded itself into his heart. Her behavior became a source that he had actually given her behavior lordship over an area of his heart. Yes. Yes. And he didn't realize it. But her her behavior made him feel rejected and made him feel like he would never find love again. And that was what was going on. It wasn't that he didn't forgive her, but he still had pain in his heart. He After having forgiven her, he still had the pain of that feeling that her treatment was telling his heart what is true. Right. Does that make sense? But so he wrote that down. I feel rejected and like I'm never going to find love. And then he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, what do you say about this? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. There's never a moment that you weren't loved. I've got all the love, you know, all these things. And he just started wrapping his, he let go of those lies and started wrapping his heart around those things. How? By speaking it in the Spirit. By speaking it in faith. Here's Psalm 42. Uh, I believe it's Psalm 42. Let me just turn. I want to give you the right reference so you can look at these if you want. Psalm 42, 5 and 6. The psalmist says this, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Do you know what? The Spirit of God, you can exercise faith in the Word of God and exercise hope. And that's how your spirit operates. You can speak with authority even to your body. 
Body, why are you sick and hurting? In Jesus' name, you're healed. Now you rise up and you be free. Devil, you go from me. You've got no authority over me. Soul, why are you so depressed and discouraged? In Jesus' name, you be you put your hope in God. I do have hope in God. Here's the neat thing about it. He says, why are you so downcast? Do you know what? He never answers that question. He never, he que- he's actually, what he's doing is he's contradicting his soul. He's not analyzing his self. He could have gone back, you know, and said, you know, sat on a, a Sigmund Freud couch, you know, and said, well, tell me about your father. You know, <laughs> he's not analyzing his past to get free from the past. That makes no sense. The more focus and attention you give negativity, the more power you're giving it over over your life. So you only focus on it to expose it. What what are my feelings believing? Amen? Amen. Write them down and say, what do you say about it? And just let the light shine. And then you purpose to come into agreement with this, to bring your heart, to wrap around, put your hope in God. These are the things. Thank you, Jesus, that this is true, that that's not true, that this is right, that that's not right, that this is you. And so uh, just keep a little notebook. of You know, if you're already keeping a journal, this is something that you can have as a journal activity. Exercise. If you're not journaling, you can have a little, um, you know, sunset free notebook. You know, <laughs> this is how God's sending my heart free. And when you find, man, I feel like I'm carrying some stuff around. Yes. All right, Jesus, and just make that part of your quiet time for that day. Yes. Just have some time, Lord. What is it that I've been dragging around? And 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 just begin to say, you write down these. This is what my feelings are believing. Lord, what do you say about that? And then you begin just to rehearse those things. Listen, you do that in the morning. You do that in the evening. Uh, and then, if this, and then uh, as you go through the day, if you start to find that those negative feelings start to get tripped up and start, you start to feel, oh, you know, that guy came in again to the store and he had his little wearing his attitude on his sleeve and I started feeling all those things. You know what you do? You just step, you stir that fresh back up. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, that I am free, that He is not my Lord, that You are my Lord. You know, all those things that He spoke to you, you just stir it up and get that fresh inside of you. The best way to remove old messages is to tape over them. (laughs) Record over them. Record over them. Nobody tapes anymore. (laughs) Record over them. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. All right. Pastor Sean. Thank you.